In December of 2020, the Alzheimer Association trumpeted news of a major $300 million increase for dementia research, raising annual federal funding alone to $3.1 billion. Alzheimer's disease, the dreaded scourge, opens wallets. The march to a promised cure feels inexorable. Yet despite this mammoth, bipartisan investment in public and private research and development over the past quarter century, pharmaceutical companies have not been able to form a magic bullet to cure or even tame Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. That includes the latest innovation fantasy churned out by the market. Marketed as Aduhelm, the first Alzheimer's drug approved by the FDA since 2003, but one facing significant questions about efficacy, safety, and cost-effectiveness. And although broad culture change and the advent of person-centered care has helped ameliorate the experience of people with dementia in nursing homes over the last several decades, loneliness, disconnection, and physical and cognitive stagnation remain problems, chronic problems, in the continued absence of useful therapeutics. And that is part of our discussion today as I interview Dr. Daniel R. George, Ph.D., and Dr. Peter Whitehouse, M.D., and Ph.D. Their book is called American Dementia, Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society. Let's talk a little bit about the authors before we bring them on. Dr. Daniel R. George, Ph.D., is a medical anthropologist and an associate professor in the Department of Humanities and the Department of Public Health Sciences at Penn State College of Medicine. Dr. Peter J. Whitehouse, M.D., Ph.D., is a professor of neurology at Case Western Reserve University and a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. He is the co-founder of an Intergenerational Schools, a network of unique public and multi-lineage community schools in Cleveland, Ohio. Together, Drs. George and Whitehouse co-authored The Myth of Alzheimer's, What You Aren't Being Told About Today's Most Dreaded Diagnosis in 2008. And today on The Intentional Clinician, I have the pleasure of speaking to them both. And we really get into it, whether you're interested in the causes of Alzheimer's, the market-driven uh, supposed cures of drugs, more holistic and integrative and functional ways and preventative ways of preventing uh, Alzheimer's disease and other illnesses of aging. And we really get into the macro level of what is going on at a societal level um, with the market, with politics, with our society, and how that may be contributing to further American dementia. I really do believe you're going to love this episode, so please stay tuned for the interview. Just a little bit about what I've been up to lately. I have just released my first course for the parents of young adults, What Do We Do Now?, which is available on Udemy right now at a discounted rate, and the link will be in the show notes. And at the end of this episode, I'll talk a little bit more about the EMDR, International Association Consultation Groups, I am now hosting online and locally. All right, thanks for listening. If you're enjoying this episode, please subscribe and share with your friends. It is my pleasure to bring on to the Intentional Clinician, Dr. Daniel George, PhD, and Dr. Peter J. Whitehouse, MD, and PhD. Welcome to the show, guys. Great to be here, Paul. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Wonderful. We're going to be discussing your uh, new book, American Dementia, Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society. And this title and subtitle are loaded with implications. And I think that it may be best to start talking about the paradigm that you're writing about, because I, I know that... Um, uh, you know, Peter is a is a medical doctor and a neuroscience researcher, as we discussed in the in the lead up. And um, Dr. George is a professor and a, and a, a scholar. So, uh, Danny, if you could tell us just a little bit about the paradigm for what inspired uh, this book you wrote together. Yeah, it's a good place to start. So, 
in November 2016, um, there was sort of a landmark moment in addition to the tumult that was happening in the broader culture at that time. Uh, there was a landmark study, uh, phase three trial of a drug called uh, solanuzumab, which was uh, one of the Eli Lilly uh, anti-amyloid drugs for, for Alzheimer's. It failed in its, in its trial. Uh, during that same month, um, there was a study published in JAMA uh, that showed decreasing rates of dementia in the United States. So you sort of had this paradoxical moment, right, where the, the biotechnology is failing as it has for the last several decades in ter terms of uh, uh, um, a drug or biologic to cure Alzheimer's, but dementia rates are falling. And so from that paradox emerged um, this book, which is trying to basically understand you know, what is it about the way that we have structured our society uh, that has ramified over the decades in this falling um, risk for dementia? And conversely, you know, what have we done in the last 40 or 50 years uh, that has perhaps reversed some of those positive trends that we're now seeing in older folks um, uh, in, in terms of like introducing more markets into our, our lives and uh, just making life more precarious and more stressful uh, for people. We still have uh, tens of millions of people on and underinsured in the country. So really when, in the title, you know, we're asking what does brain health look like in an unhealthy society and challenging us to think big about how we can uh, instantiate better brain health again in, in the future. Excellent. And I, I think we need to bring in a little bit about definition of a healthy brain and what might um, cause a brain to move into an unhealthy state, which could then lead to a, a multi uh, faceted disease such as Alzheimer's. So I'm wondering if Peter, you would maybe jump in here for a moment and talk about uh, some of the things Danny mentioned from the medical perspective, uh, some of the stress, um, the precariousness of uh, modern life and, and how that might affect the brain from a medical perspective. Yes, thanks, Paul. So the brain, of course, is an important organ. Um, it does require a body to function properly. So health is better viewed as something that's more systemic and holistic. But the brain, like the rest of the body, requires um, adequate nutrition, adequate stimulation, both physical and mental, uh, adequate uh, engagement in community in ways we could discuss going forward, because part of our concern is that it's our communities that are unhealthy. But as a physician, I would counsel the individual patient to uh, attend to these factors to keep their brain healthy, the diet, exercise, and social engagement. Uh, the brain health word has risen into huge ascendancy as people have recognized, just as Danny said, that preventing illness, preventing disease, and maintaining health is a better long-term strategy. As a physician, I became very concerned about the general notion in the field that the way to prevent disease is to take a pill. Uh, we, we say we have pills for ills, but sometimes uh, it's not clear that we don't develop the pills first and then go looking for something to treat. So I became very concerned about the role of the pharmaceutical industry in keeping our keeping us healthy or not yeah so i think that's a a good intersection right there to discuss some of that because in as person in the field of psychology we see prevention as pivotal to mental health and ongoing maintenance um without drugs or without therapy involves all of the things you mentioned uh, an individual being able to regulate their environment at least somewhat with exercise, diet, working on stress-reducing activities, socialization, we see those as the markers that prevent mental illness. Um, and you're talking, of course, broadly about all illnesses. Um, and so uh, we also see the promises on the commercials on television and on the internet about if you take this pill, all of a sudden things are better for you. Uh, and um, from all sorts of things. And, and if, as you said, as we've obviously established, there's been a lot of excellent medications that have helped save lives, but there's also this sort of, 
idea um, that if there's a symptom, you can play whack-a-mole with symptoms. And for somehow that's preventing disease. Whack-a-mole is a fun game where the moles come and you hit them with the mallet. So it's like whack-a-mole with symptoms. And then you, all of a sudden, this is somehow, you know, curing everybody. But I think what I've understood from, from what I, my, my field is that that's just a Band-Aid sort of covering up and palliatively, uh, temporarily sometimes helping the, the person feel better, but it may not necessarily get to the roots of the actual disease or, or the reasons the person is having the symptoms to begin with. So, um, Danny, you, you have a lot of knowledge about, um, some of the trends in society and some of the markers that, I mean, are even economic, um, in implications and, and how that is shaping our society into what we might call an unhealthy society and how that might affect brain health. So based on what Peter laid out and what I've been saying from my experience, can you talk about maybe some of the trends you're seeing uh, in society that may um, be sort of causing um, these some of these issues? And then of course, the the marketplace's answer for the for that. Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll um, underscore again, the, um, the study that I mentioned in 2016, which showed falling rates of dementia for people, um, in their retirement years in the United States, that finding has also been, uh, uh, noted in other, in five other countries in Canada, the UK, France, Sweden, and the Netherlands. So we're seeing these falling rates of dementia. And that makes you ask, well, why is that happening for people who are in their graying years now? And so you look at the mid 20th century, sort of post-World War II, and you think about, as Peter was saying, you know, what, what processes in the society, uh, you know, kind of produced better brain health. And you look at things like the GI Bill, for instance, which uh, introduced higher education to 10 million more Americans. Uh, you look at improving healthcare systems, um, you know, for every country other than the US, they implemented universal healthcare systems. So that led to better treatment of vascular risk factors, uh, which we know impact brain health um, significantly. Uh, smoking cessation rates uh, fell substantially about 44% of people smoked in the 60s, and now it's down to around 10% in the US. That's due to public health campaigns for smoking cessation. We obviously deleted gasoline um, in the 70s through the Clean, Clean Air Act. So a lot of these um, uh, public health interventions that were sort of the result of social democratic investments in population health seem to have ramified in better brain health and cognitive reserve for the uh, cohort of people who are now advancing into their graying years. But as you say, Paul, um, you know, we've, since the seventies, we've sort of substantially dismantled a lot of the new deal structures in place. We've introduced marketization uh, into all, almost all aspects of our lives. Uh, there's There's been uh, wage stagnation uh, for the last 40 years. Um, there's uh, been austerity regimes put in place that have cut social services for people. Um, you know, Americans, the American working class has really struggled during this time period. Uh, and of course, education is one of those resources that we know is protective for the brain, but has been financialized over the last several decades, pricing a lot of people out of education. So the worry is that, uh, the trends that we saw sort of, um, initiated in the mid 20th century are going to now be reversed as a result of the unhealthy society that we've sort of put in its place, which has led to runaway inequality and austerity and uh, falling lifespan now, as we know, and deaths of despair in the United States. So it's sort of a bleak picture, um, unfortunately, but the positive message of the book is that there are things that we know pull the levers in society that can impact brain health in a positive way. So I think I'm going to have Peter comment here, but my first comment is, so with these large uh, advances in society with the New Deal and uh, all these other public health campaigns and social services, all of a sudden we we saw dementia rates going down and other, other things like that. We saw health improvements. And it's interesting because um, there have been a lot of campaigns and negative talk against social services and against uh, universal health care in the United States and having a safety net um, seen as uh, culturally sort of picked on as like, a, you know, the government being people's parents or, uh, you know, sort of like a weak 
a weakness instead of seeing it as like a, a wow, we're the richest country in the world. If we provided this, imagine having a basic safety net for our individuals. How much more could we excel? How much how much better could we get as a country together? And what what I'm hearing is those public health investments. You can you can sort of correlate uh, with you know death rates, dementia rates, these sort of things, and uh, how long people were living and how well it, these these things had a greater, broader impact that trickled down to the individual. Um, and then, of course, we saw with the COVID nineteen crisis, multiple different things we saw, but just one of them, if people weren't dying from the disease, they were stressed out about the lockdown or the changes in their life. And we saw alcohol rates, uh, alcohol drinking rates go up. Uh, I, I know marijuana sales were through the roof. I'm not really sure about cigarettes, but, um, you know, and then we saw a lot of other unhealthy things coming out. So it's like, what I'm hearing is if the society as a whole invests in the health health of the people in a preventative way, then we're actually seeing this on a, on a medical level. And we're seeing this in the research that these have broad effects um, that maybe we don't need just some magic pill to fix, um, in this case, Alzheimer's. Um, Peter, uh, well, Danny, feel free to comment. And then Peter also. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I can hop in. I, I appreciate that point. In the book that we we're publishing, we talk not just about cognitive reserve, but about population reserve. So, uh, you know, what is the result of these investments in population health and public health? You see them at the population level. Uh, and, and um, you know, so we, we really, our charge in the book is to think about the structures and systems and institutions that can um, multiply brain health across large numbers of people. Our book is not a self-help book. It's an other help book. We're trying to get people to think more broadly about brain health, not just their own brains. And of course, that is a very tough sell because, you know, since we've marketized everything, you know, what Peter and I call the marketplace of memory, uh, we have not just, um, you know, billions of dollars going into drug development to find the pill for the ill, you know, that will, will cure Alzheimer's or slow its uh, uh, treatment, or slow, slow its onset. Uh, but you also have brain health products, digital games, um, uh, apps on phones, a, a lot of these products that are marketed in very disingenuous ways, uh, you know, around individual consumption, the idea that if you have sort of an, if you're an enlightened consumer and you eat your blueberries and pomegranates and play Sudoku uh, and buy the, the latest gadget that that's being sold to you, um, you know, in the zombie ads that follow you around on the internet, uh, you, you will prevent Alzheimer's disease, but we're saying that 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 whole proposition is is empty and hollow. Uh, we need to be thinking again, you know, remembering the lessons that we've forgotten with our American dementia about what has truly impacted brain health at the population level over the last fifty years. Excellent. Yes, that that makes a lot of sense. Peter, can you chime in here about your perspective? <clears throat> Absolutely. Let me build on a word that Danny used: lever. Um, a social or cultural lever. And it gets to your comments about COVID, Paul. We think that thinking deeply about brain aging, how the brain works, and how um, we as a society need to figure out how to act more collectively. Uh, probably the best thing for brain health uh, is not any kind of individual mental activity, but a social activity. So COVID has certainly told us that our country, particularly, uh, and particularly in certain states where the politics drive towards individualism, is challenged to mount a collective response to something that should be more easily addressable if in fact we could work together. I would add the climate crisis, because uh, I sometimes say, that the climate, the greatest threat to the quality of life of people with dementia is not uh, disinvestment in basic research. It's climate change because it's the greatest threat to all of us. So if you lever our thinking, our narrow thinking, that we can just fix things with a computer game or a pill, then we can take brain health into a broader area of, of social life that says we have to make some fundamental changes in the way we act collectively. And as Daddy said, that gets into economics. It gets into politics. Uh, and uh, so even though Alzheimer's and dementia are big problems in and of themselves, 
they're actually more important than just those particular conditions because they're a way of saying getting through our fear, getting rid of our false hopes, getting rid of our our un, un skeptical faith in technological solutions and say, what do we have to do to work together to address the problems of brain aging and the problems of society at large in this rather challenged uh, world that we're all participating in? Yes, that is bringing it. Uh, to a new level of discussion, because I was even just thinking about, you know, the zombie ads that have followed me around on the internet, such as download this app and you'll be calm and you'll feel all copacetic. And I, not a bad idea to download that app and be copacetic, but if the greater reason you're not calm is you feel disconnected, isolated, you don't exercise, you eat trash, which I, I don't mean to call it out, but fast food is sort of trash. I looks, one of my old one of a person i knew once told me that his drug dealer was on every corner i said what do you mean we're you know in the suburbs he said every fast food drive through is my drug dealer and it's killing me and he he was right and he is right so mm -hmm. you know if you if you're doing these things what it, 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 this app is might help you palliatively for a few minutes a day but it's not it, it's just another thing that you bought that is you know, like you said, it, it's distracting from the actual overall solution. Um, it's somebody's good idea. You know, if we all use the app every day, we might all be calm. But really, is that that's that's not the root of the issue. So, um, yeah, this 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 whole way of thinking almost has to change. Uh, and you talked about individualism versus collectivism uh, a little bit, and how actually we can see it in certain states. Um, but, you know, especially during COVID-19, you can look at the numbers of uh, deaths or, or you know, infections. And I'm sure there's so many statistics that I'm not even, I've, I've looked at briefly in some of the newspapers, but um, it's just, it's stunning to see the differences. Uh, and so maybe either one of you, what, what are your thoughts to take this a little further? Because it, it sounds like what, what you're asking for is how do we work together? How do we how do we know the markers of brain health and how do we then make a society somehow that can evoke some of these conditions that lead to a greater overall experience and thus our individual things we do would would help us but we would already have a higher baseline of health is that what i'm hearing yeah i think that's a good way of putting it um it, and and just to return to one of the points you were making i i, I do think that what we've ushered in in the last 40 years, which some people call neoliberalism, some people call it hypercapitalism. Um, it has uh, sort of put forward a almost religious understanding of, of the world in, in terms of salvation through consumption. Uh, and that we're, we're, you know, we can fix ourselves, we can save ourselves if we if we consume in the right ways. And that has produced also a context where culturally we we look for innovation fantasies. And, you know, I would put the marketplace of memory products in that. I would put supplements and all of those things in that. And the, the drug development approaches are all innovation fantasies within this sort of neoliberal context. Um, but if we, if we start thinking more broadly, uh, we do have to start thinking in, in terms of political economy, in terms of, um, you know, what policies are going to um, uh, impact the most number of people universally in the culture and how do we achieve those? And we're in a very difficult moment politically right now. And I, I, I almost apologize for my nihilism on it, but I don't think either political party is capable of providing the types of changes that we had post-World War II. Even basic Keynesian social democracy seems a bridge too far for a politics that's entirely captured by the upper class and moneyed interests and corporate interests. Um, so where do, where do we find hope? I mean, there, there's it's not hopeless. There there can be change, and sometimes crises can produce change. We all hope COVID would be the the stimulus that would provide that sort of uh, of of mode impetus for change. But we didn't. I don't think we were there yet. At the local level, though, there are things we can do, and I'll um, you know highlight something that Peter has done uh, with his wife Kathy, which is to start an intergenerational school in Cleveland, where we're both from. And this is the first school in uh, known in the world to actually create a mentor role for people living with dementia. Uh, they serve as reading mentors to kids, largely from Cleveland's inner city. Uh, they participate in classroom activities and the arts. Uh, we do nature ac activities through the school uh, that are intergenerational in their nature. So 
kind of demystifying what it means to be a person with dementia and creating the relationships that are protective and, and the social bonds that Peter alluded to that we know are protective is one thing that we can do um, at the local level. I don't know, Peter, if you want to build on that at all, because the school is sort of your baby. Well, thanks for mentioning it, Danny. And, and I should point out that Danny got his PhD doing mixed methods research on the benefits of uh, volunteering and learning and mentoring uh, in the school for people with uh, what we call cognitive challenges. So I think I'll generalize it and say, yes, I, we think intergenerational learning, which has really been part of the foundation of our species uh, that we've always learned in groups and family members. But in today's siloed society, we tend to put learners into a particular location because of a certain age. Well, we think uh, developmentally appropriate learning spaces should be multi-age. But I'm also working on the future of universities uh, because we, we really do face uh, uh, the need to transform our civilization, quite literally, to make it more sustainable. Neoliberalism, the word that Danny taught me, this idea that money is the only value that's important and uh, it's making the fast buck and thinking about the next quarter is destroying us. And learning is the way out of this. Another word that I use a lot is um, transdisciplinarity. Now, I don't know whether that word shows up in, in the intentional clinician much, but the idea that we have siloed our uh, educational systems, not only by age, but by discipline. And no one discipline is going to solve these wicked problems that we're facing. No one discipline is going to address the challenges of brain aging or the climate crisis. So once again, Dementia, uh, the American dementia is telling us we have to develop learning environments that bridge and explore the boundaries between disciplines. So that word transdisciplinarity signals yet again the need to take different approaches to learning. And it is learning that we as a species have survived and thrived around. It's, it's my passion. It, it's something that brings purpose and intention to my own life and to many people's lives. So let's, let's, let's look at the future of lifelong learning as a source of hope, which Danny and I keep coming back to. We've got to have, we've got a lot of false hope in this world. We need some true hope going back to some fundamentals about what it means to be a human being. I, could not agree more. I have so many comments, but I'll try to just make them briefly. Um, so actually, oddly enough, the last episode was about this book called Consilience, which is basically about the agreement between the approaches of different academic subjects where the science and humanities would sort of bridge and you would cross uh, interdisciplinarily discuss topics um, instead of having a silo. Uh, a siloed approach where you focus only on your um, expertise. And I do think that's important for society to have these discussions and people on the local level, is, that's where it's got to start. And like you said, I'm, I'm not an expert on universities, but it does seem like you're right. It, it's like you go to the university, you're this age, this is your, what you do, this is what you study, and there's not as much cross-pollination um, or maybe not as much as we need. So um, I, I was also just thinking about the metaphor of health. Um, if, uh, if you only look at one system of the body as the problem, we know from functional medicine that you're probably missing the boat because all of the systems tug on one, one another and sort of, that's another metaphor and not really tug, but sort of affect one another. So if we're only, you know, if we're, if we're treating depression and we're only thinking about the brain and we're not thinking about the fact that this person uh, has massive inflammation from their diet, uh, is isolated, is, um, I don't know, uh, having problems at work, having problems with housing. And we're like, oh, well, they're, they have a chemical imbalance and Prozac will fix that. Um, a chemical imbalance is, is such a snake oil term because of course they have a chemical imbalance every we all have chemical imbalances all the time it's a matter of on the spectrum of depression but that but to say to the person wow your brain is broken sorry take this that that's that's kind of 
not the whole that's not even close to the whole story you know the 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 whole situation they're in is broken and that's causing this uh this symptom so i was thinking about how you were talking about the siloed approach and in, in the disciplines and not working together uh and how that is is actually a metaphor for what i see it is happening in healthcare as well um and also probably driven by market forces um and getting back to some basics i don't know if you are both familiar with dr daniel siegel and his series of interpersonal neurobiology. He's out of UCLA, he's a psychiatrist, but really interesting, very holistic and uh, integrative uh, person. And he just talks in his book about interpersonal neurobiology. And I think you actually said it earlier, Peter, about these like five or six factors for the healthy brain. And he did it by statistics. And I don't have it in front of me, but one of them was like having time to reflect. So downtime, having time to socialize, having time to recreate, um, uh, working on something that you're passionate about or, or a job or something like that. Um, uh, making sure you have adequate sleep and then nutrition. I think, I think those were the six or seven that he mentioned. And he, then he had every study correlating or, or showing how this showed up. And it was just interesting how, um, what you were talking about this, the situation of neoliberalism and the, the market driving everything and, and, uh, money being the most important thing, uh, you know, underlying it, even if people say it's not, it's, it's what it's behaviorism. You can see it, uh, in behavioral economics, you can just see that this is what's driving, um, the discussion that we're, we're missing those, those things as values. And, and I think that those things as, if those things were value, that is prevention in a way, because that's people taking care of themselves. But it's also, if our society doesn't have, if, if we don't have some sort of way to educate people to help them be able to do this we're setting them up to fail and then we're setting them up to be dependent on multiple addictions which feed the marketplace of those things like food drugs alcohol and we're also feeding the marketplace of pills to fix those things thus increasing market shares of 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 things that uh, could be prevented by behavior changes so anyway that was i guess my comments on that um, where, where are you guys at with that? Yeah, so I, I can, I can jump in there. I, so in the book, we, um, refer to the parable of the three blind men and the elephant, um, in, in thinking about Alzheimer's disease and essentially what's happened over the last two decades is we have defined Alzheimer's disease as being plaques and tangles, uh, and uh, built sort of business models around that single mechanism drug approach. And of course, we've lost the whole elephant at that point. Uh, just to build on what you were saying, Paul, the Alzheimer's is a syndrome. Uh, it, it's probably more appropriately called Alzheimer's diseases because you don't just see plaques and tangles. They're often vascular features. Most dementias are mixed uh, and, and have overlapping um, aging processes um, uh, attendant in them. Um, there are multiple risk factors. Alzheimer's is a very multifactorial condition. So we've almost mistakenly in, in this reductive neoliberal uh, marketplace defined Alzheimer's incorrectly as just one thing uh, when it is multiple things. And that has stifled, completely stifled our thinking about uh, how to approach it. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to go back to the question you asked me before, I, I don't want to be too nihilistic, but if we do think about the whole elephant and how our society could help uh, people at, at the, the the population level that we're, we're, we're discussing here, I mean, there, obviously, if we think about the wisdom of the studies that we were talking about before, providing health care uh, universally would treat the vascular risk factors that are part of this syndrome, right? Uh, providing um, universal higher education and vocational training, which has been talked about for years, uh, would help build cognitive reserve uh, to, to help with this syndrome. Uh, we're facing another lead crisis. Obviously, Flint has been the highest profile uh, example of that, but lead is present in drinking water all over the country. It's, it's even higher in Cleveland, where I'm from, where Peter lives, uh, than it was in Flint. Um, we, we could overhaul our infrastructure and get lead out of our water. Um, we can provide a living wage for people. We could provide better security nets and safety nets. All of those things, when we think about the whole elephant of what causes brain aging, what causes dementia, all of those things would um, uh, would help us kind of see the forest for the trees and, and make a real impact. So I, I, I would question the, um, 
uh, how realistic those things are in our current political arrangement. But, you know, if we were to have a roadmap for things that we could collectively do, I think that would be a good place to start. So, so, um, just to pick up on the forest for the trees and to connect Danny's comments to what you were saying. Um, yes, mother nature is modern society has tended to separate human beings from mother nature. We can control mother nature. We can rape the planet, pardon my language to extract fossil fuels and, and tear down the forests in order to make our short term lives somehow better, but as you said, Paul, kind of shallow. Uh, change is coming, uh, and it's coming faster than we expected. The, the latest um, uh, IPCC report, you know, suggests that major changes are afoot. If we needed more uh, information about that, I mean, just pick up the paper and see what's burning, what's drying up, what's, uh, what's flooded. So change is going to happen. Uh, and the question is, can we human beings learn about uh, these ourselves and and, the, and these changes in order to act more effectively in the world. The problem of aducanumab, that un very unfortunate approval, is going to disappear when other problems um, uh, essentially uh, give us um, more concern. So I, I'm gonna, I want to just uh, say one last thing, which is connect to why I like the uh, title of your your broadcast, the intentional clinician. What do human beings bring into the world? They bring in purpose and intention. And this is a time to really reflect, as you also said, Paul, on what it is we get joy out of in, in life. Is it the quick availability of fast food or is it the family gathering uh, around uh, traditional ethnic food? Well, I think we know the answer to that question. We have, in fact, have to go back. Modernity is destroying us. That's to say this techno-science faith that we have. Look at the indigenous peoples, how they teach us about relating to nature, how they teach us about uh, the important things in life. And that includes the power of stories. We are a, uh, a and, and that's been a feature in your, in your podcast for, for quite a number of the sessions, the idea that we have to tell a different story about why we want to get up in the morning, what is our intention, what is our purpose, how do we want to help other people, because that's the way that many people get deep meaning in their lives, and we seem to have forgotten that in our hyper-individualistic society. Yeah, I couldn't agree more philosophically, and I think we've lost track of the basics big time, and I think it's it's difficult to even, uh, I think we've also lost context, you know, with it, it, uh, the way uh, the availability of the internet over my life is quad, I don't know, when I was, I think I got my first digital phone that had the internet on it when I was 24 or something like that, but I mean, just the amount of time people spend reading things. And somebody recently said to me, you know, they're asking me about the news and they said, well, where do you, what do you watch? I said, I don't watch the news. They said, well, what do you read? And I explained, I read certain papers and magazines that have like a longer sort of telling of the story, which is still not the whole story. And, and I was explaining that and they, and, and they were asking me about the Afghanistan crisis. And I was like, well, this goes back 20 years and actually goes back way before that, but 20 years from what I remember. And here's what I know about it. And they said, well, I've actually been getting most of my information from memes on the internet. And I said, what? And they said, well, I heard about the, what they were doing and what was going on from these cartoons that people were making. And I was like, oh goodness. Now we have bigger fish to fry than that, but that's kind of an idea of how the technological world has even made us even more individual individuated we don't even know what story's going on we're relying on some joke of somebody's point of view about something and kind of breaking uh, even further fragmenting any sort of collective story you know our, our collective story is broken and there's you know politically we could go into that for hours which we won't but there's multiple there's two or three stories going on in the united states if you ask somebody about a basic fact of of what's going on with covid19 or what's going on with our political life, you'll get like vastly different answers that sort of 
question reality, but a lot of that is, uh, so the hard part is how, how can we on our own or not on our own, but locally learn how to work together. I, I wanted to ask you about the study of the nuns and just getting back to kind of, I want to make sure we cover this, the Alzheimer's thing a little bit. I like that we've gone to the macro, but I want to ask a little bit about these amyloid deposits and uh, the the nun study that was in your book about the Catholic sisters. Sure. Um, so one of the uh, challenges in the Alzheimer's field has been the dominance of a hypothesis called the amyloid hypothesis, where people have zeroed in for some good reasons on this one particular protein abnormality. That's what aducanumab is supposed to address, and that's where a lot of the techno-scientific optimism is coming from. But the nuns were just one of several studies that showed that people can live into late life as perfectly functional, happy members of a community, in this case, a religious community, uh, scattered in a number of places uh, around the world, where they, the nuns offered to donate their brains after they died so they could be studied and uh, found what might relate to why some nuns had some cognitive challenges and others didn't. And they found that about 40% of the nuns had this protein, amyloid, in their brain, but did not have cognitive impairment. And so that is a real challenge to those that think that getting rid of amyloid by aducanumab or aduhelm, as you called it, the brand name, um, is uh, is the answer to, uh, to brain health. Uh, the nuns had a healthy lifestyle. They had a community. They had lots of things that were important for brain health. But one of the things that community demonstrated because of their volunteering for this study was having amyloid in the brain does not necessarily relate to having a dementia, a very important contribution. And so that kind of goes back to how are we living and how are we aging? And we were talking about how everyone's living, but if we talk about how, um, is there a perspective on, I, I've just noticed um, with with people that are aging is they tend to be more isolated. They're not, like you said, you've made this intergenerational school to bring um, older adults into a role of purpose and meaning again, to have something to do, to contribute to society. And, and I noticed a big difference when I was in Europe, that when I was at the pub or whatever, let's just say in Ireland, one of the places I was, there was all types of, uh, all ages were there intermixing and talking. Um, obviously the young people would kind of branch off to their side of the room, but they were all in the same area, you know, and they would relate to each other. And, and I thought when I came back to the U.S., I don't see this in the U.S. just at, at in recreation. It's like there's, when you go to certain places to eat or drink, uh, especially places where people socialize, not just a dinner restaurant. Um, we're very cut. We're very separated by age. And um, there's not a lot of cross pollination. And then I think about older adults that I've known being more and more isolated. And I thought that from the psychology standpoint, isolation is one of the worst things that you can do for mental health. And I'm thinking, okay, is that having something to do with the fact of, you know, just senility or whatever you want to call it in a broad way, which is, I don't even know if that's a medical term, but you know, if you don't, if you don't, what do they say that if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. And if in motion is lotion to your joints, if you don't move, you start, you start getting problems in your tissues and your joints. So I, I wonder if not, not, this is, I'm not the doctor here, but I'm wondering if some of these preventions of, of having people living in community, you know, I, I interviewed somebody from Silicon Valley and they're working on well aging projects where they put people from different age groups living in some sort of like, kind of, I don't know, like not an old folks community necessarily to use terrible language like that, but sort of like an intentional community of different ages where they recreate and, and spend time together. And they were studying that and they were talking about their theory was that people would age better and that, um, and live longer 
um, was their their thing. Uh, last thing I'll say before leaving it to you guys, I saw another comparison with the Nun study and the focus and the focus of the drug companies on this amyloid deposit. It reminded me of Dr. John Sarno, MD. I don't know if you know him, but he did hundreds of studies on back pain and unnecessary surgeries. And what he was noticing was that people had this theory that if you had this certain spinal degeneration, you were going to have all this back pain. And then the only way, according to this theory, to cure it, of course, was with very expensive invasive surgery that could possibly then lead to massive long-term side effects. And what he noticed was in a lot of his studies is that people, uh, well, this is, he's got whole books on this. So just, I'll summarize it, but on the x-rays and in the scans, what he was seeing was that certain people had all sorts of, you know, degeneration from age on their spine and had no pain reported. But he looked at the rest of their life and saw what they were doing. They were active. They had uh, emotional um, out outlets, social outlets, pretty good mental health. And then he looked at people with the pain of all ages, with or without degeneration, and often without complaining of this back pain, this lower back pain. And he was noticing then sort of um, bigger picture things going on in their lives, including mental health issues, uh, difficult jobs, and stress. And how then they were all getting these back surgeries that were unnecessary. So he was a pioneer in sort of showing that our understanding of back pain based on this theory that spinal degeneration is causing this is actually not a uh, solid connection uh, every time. So anyway. <clears throat> so as the neurologist who sees lots of older people with back pain, I can certainly... Um endorse that perspective um the last thing you want to do is to have surgery unless um it's a very specific reason and um in fact this is a lesson in this neoliberal environment that we live in um about 35 years ago we had an office of technology assessment at the um u.s congress it was their information arm I was the co-author of a report on Alzheimer's disease, the looming crisis back then. OTA no longer exists because a bunch of Republican right-wing back surgeons objected to the re very objective report that the uh, F OTA did that found exactly what you just described. And they got together and they essentially eliminated the ability of our Congress to have an information arm there are some signs that that might come that people are advocating for it coming back but this is an example of how people with power in this case back surgeons who made a lot of money out of harming people got rid of the ability for a democracy to act with the knowledge that would then ensure that some of the same things that would benefit people with cognitive challenges exercise and um social support uh, was 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 uh, missing for people with back pain. So this idea that there there are some I know you wanted to stay focused on on Alzheimer's, but the fact is that if we made some changes in that field, got a little smarter, a little wiser about where we spent our money, we could make a big difference to a lot of people with a lot of chronic conditions. In fact, prevent some of those chronic conditions, uh, or at least slow the pro the onset of them. So it's a big issue, Paul, and, and I like your comparison, which I tried to emphasize and draw together. Oh, yeah, I'm okay. I think I really want people to read the book. And so there's a lot about dementia and Alzheimer's in there that people can read. But I do like that we're, you're both extrapolating this to how our society is currently functioning. And so um, I had another comparison, but I want to lend it over to Danny for a minute because I think he's got something uh, to say about this. Oh, absolutely. No, uh, you, I, it's fun riffing on what you guys are saying here, but, um, you know, to kind of connect to something you said before, Paul, I think we have to be clear eyed about our political arrangement right now and the sort of class solidarity that occurs among the wealthy and super wealthy and their capture of our institutions. And if we're going to have any corrective to this, uh, working class solidarity is imperative. And why don't we have that? Well, as you said earlier, Paul, 
we we have a sort of marketized news environment that fragments the working class along the lines of culture war. Uh, and so unity and shared sense of purpose and interdependence just get fractured into a, a thousand pieces. And I think we need to, any, any attempt to correct the course on our unhealthy society needs to start from the premise that our politics are broken. Um, uh, but, you know, one, one, tr one thing I want to build on from what you said too, Paul, is um, it, we have this trope in Alzheimer's where we talk about a loss of self. But one of the uh, really harmful things for people with dementia is the loss of place. So, um, you know, thinking about the, the end of the life course um, and the loneliness and that the, the sort of toxic isolation that can happen. Um, obviously, there are things we can do to mitigate that. Things like senior centers, which are increasingly being framed as intergenerational centers, but which have been on the cutting block during the last decade of austerity. Um, you know, both parties have, have cut things like senior centers and funding for senior centers. So we really need to be vigilant about, about those things. We also need, in thinking about Alzheimer's as a lifespan condition, to think upstream. Because if you think about something like Flint, Flint uh, had 80,000 jobs in, in the mid-century, and it now has less than 8,000. That led to uh, cutting the environmental regulatory agencies through their austerity cuts at the state level. It led to cost savings in switching from the uh, from Lake Huron to the Flint River as their water source, and the corrosiveness of the water obviously is what led to lead poisoning. Um, but if we're thinking in a lifespan uh, in lifespan terms here, those kids in Flint who are exposed to lead, they're going to have less cells and synapses. They're going to have increased risk for heart disease. Uh, they're going to have uh, just simply less cognitive reserve uh, as they advance in their in their lives. And so, in thinking about um, uh, you know brain health, we really need to think about that lifespan approach and how can we redirect our broken political system so that we are creating healthy bodies and healthy minds across that whole lifespan and not selling anybody short or leaving anybody behind. I think that's where the real challenge is. So. Let me just build on that because I'm the geriatrician, but I think about the future and I think about when the kids in our elementary schools uh, are elders. We've got that's one of the problems our society has to do is take that long term perspective. So let's think about how we build communities, not just to be beneficial for older people, but like those senior centers or our intergenerational schools where the generations work together. Let me say a couple of summary things about Alzheimer's disease that might entice people to read American Dementia, Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society by also mentioning our first book, The Myth of Alzheimer's, What You Aren't Being Told About Today's Most Dreaded Diagnosis. They kind of go together. There's a 10-year gap between them, roughly speaking. Alzheimer's, as Danny said, is not one thing. Every time you hear somebody call something, a, particularly a disease, by a single na uh, name, be suspicious. It's a syndrome. There are multiple things. And we don't even know whether it's different than brain aging. Paul, you used the word senility, which has kind of gone out of favor. But the idea that uh, that there are aging changes that occur in our own, all our, in our brains and in our backs is really something important to recognize. So the idea that um, this is something that can be fixed because it's one thing different than aging is 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 not right. The, the, even though our title was uh, was provocative, in fact, most people believe what I just said. So it's a time for dramatic changes in how we think about age-related cognitive changes. And the second book really says what uh, what we've been talking about in this call. Why is it that we as a society cannot recognize? The the, uh, the failings of our short-term uh, technologically focused thinking and why that is also why we are not addressing COVID and the climate crisis adequately. So that's the connect there. Think about what the lessons we should be learning from about dementia and apply those to other social uh, uh, challenges that are even more important, frankly. Yes, I, I couldn't agree more. I really am excited for people to uh, hopefully read your book and listen to this and look into both of your, um, you know, your your website and everything I'm going to be putting in notes so people can learn more about this. I have to just say, since we've been on this topic, uh, th th I've, the market is 
a, a wild thing. I won't even get into that. But Wall Street and the ups and downs, and we have to make quarterly reports for the shareholders. It, it reminds me in psychology of what I would just call, I, I would call it hyper individualism. Because it's good to have boundaries and have your own routine that you like, that you feel is coping for your life. But when when your individualism goes into hyper and it starts and, and choices you're making, such as those people that uh, got rid of the committee that you're talking about and, and, and argue for back surgery, which is expensive and, I mean, almost you know detrimental to the people receiving it in, in, in some cases... Um, your hyper individualism and want for more and want and want for more money or more power or whatever starts to damage everyone else's individual lives and so collectively if if money is the most important thing in a society then it does turn into some sort of terrible nihilistic post-apocalyptic um dystopia and I think I've, I've been seeing flavorings of dystopia uh, since I've been aware enough to understand it uh, in my 20s, and, and now I'm almost 40. But a couple of things I wanted to say just about this was it, it does take individuals waking up to how they've been participating in this society and how locally they can make a change. Um, and I just think about little examples from from my uh, from my field, and this is something that I don't have answers on, but I was I, I work in a mental health clinic, and we are reimbursed less for family therapy than we are for individual therapy. How does that even make any sense? I don't know. No one has been able to tell me, but every insurance company pays mm, I don't know twenty dollars average less or thirty dollars less. If we have a family in a room, multiple people versus one person, what is that telling us right there? That is telling us that to the clinician who may be needing extra money, I'll, I'll just focus on this child. I'll just work on this child and their mental illness. When really, when I'm, always, I'm a clinical supervisor, I say, do not treat a child in isolation ever unless it's a situation where they need emancipation and their, ch- and their parents are abusive. And if their parents are abusive, neglectful, obviously we do that. But if if not, why are we not bringing the family in? And and that right there, there's a de-incentive to be bringing in a collective opinion um, about the child and how to educate the parents. Another thing, group therapy. Group therapy is amazing. The studies show a, a, a tremendous benefit to people that are involved in group therapy. Yet it's so it's so hard to put together unless you're a hospital. If you're an outpatient clinic like where I'm at, it's so difficult to get it going. It's so difficult to get reimbursed. It's almost de-incentivized versus individual therapy, which you can pretty much you know, work with somebody in their schedule to, to make it. So right there, we're having an individualistic push in psychology, which we know from the psychology literature itself is not good. It's not, I mean, it's it's fine, but it's not the, the best we could do. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just throw in here, which... Uh, and then we'll kind of have you both kind of talk about how people can learn more was just to, another comparison that just came into my mind with this dementia study that you were talking about um, with the Alzheimer's. But the study from, there's multiple studies of this, but the Baylor College of Medicine study from 2002 that, that found that common knee surgery was no better than placebo um, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And essentially what happened was a bunch of people got fake knee surgery uh, who had osteoarthritis and a bunch of people got real knee surgery and the people with fake knee surgery had incisions. They weren't deep. They were just artificial on the, uh, like scratches on their skin to make it look like they had the surgery. So no one knew who really had it, who didn't, they went under anesthesia and the people that didn't get the knee surgery, the randomized group there, actually there was three groups. Um, but anyway, the, 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 the long and short of it is essentially the people that did not actually get knee surgery went to the same physical therapy that the people with knee surgery went to. Of course, they could go sooner because they didn't have as much inflammation and swelling and all of this sort of thing. And they recovered at a tremendously uh, larger rate than the people that had had actual knee surgery because 
they were moving around and they were learning how to move with the damage in their knees or, you know, with their aging knees and the osteoarthritis and the groups who uh, had the knee surgery recovered at a much slower rate. And a lot of them had continual chronic osteoarthritis uh, thing. So right there is kind of playing into the whole paradigm of what is Alzheimer's, what it's a syndrome, what is this difficulty with aging and how do we handle it? Um, and how, and, and there's some bigger, of course, local implications, but there's also the larger societal implications. So anyway, that was my last comment. I want to, I want to hear what you both have to say kind of in, in closing and, and then maybe, uh, wh where people can learn more. And of course your book. Yeah, no, that it's it's amazing how the incentives um, of the economy drive us away from common sense, uh, as you're describing, Paul. And some people refer to the economy, you know, since we've sort of unleashed the beast of it, it starting in the 70s when we started deregulating the economy, referred to it as the zombie economy because it just lurches forward, you know, towards quarterly earnings, trampling on anything in its path, outsourcing tens of millions of jobs, uh, and, and not investing in anything unless there's a business plan in place. So there's a business plan in place for amyloid. That's why we're getting billions of dollars invested in these drugs that don't work. Um, and so, uh, you know, ultimately, um, as Peter and I say, we're this is American dementia. We we are facing a, a type of psychosis. <laughs> uh, we're not very good as, at our acti activities of daily living, as Peter says. So the culture does have a bit of a dementia uh, and, and limits to its thinking right now. Um, and uh, until we can break out of that and start thinking outside of a market logic, um, you know, about collective investments, things that we know will benefit everybody that maybe not be profitable, perhaps, or part of a business um, plan, um, you know, you, we're not going to make progress against the syndrome that is Alzheimer's disease, which is multifactorial and a lifespan condition. And so really, Peter and I want that to be our message. We need to think in a radically different way about what we mean, what we talk about when we talk about Alzheimer's disease. Well said, Danny. And let me um, throw a word in um, that's part of my teaching these days, my intergenerational teaching. So I teach a course, Wising Up, Designing a Course for the Future, and another one, Wisdom Sits in Places. So it is time for the homo sapiens that we say to be to wise up a bit and recognize that we have created systems that are dysfunctional and unhealthy. One of the things we have to do is speak truth to power. And as Danny knows, my department chairman, after we took a look at our book, said, hey, you guys are speaking truth to power. The power is the pharmaceutical industries. The power is the co-opted experts who get paid millions of dollars. And the power also is the National Alzheimer's Association, which is a difficult group of people to talk about because they do good at the local level. But the national leader of the Alzheimer's Association took the credit for getting this aducanumab, uh, Adjahelm approved, which they deserve, unfortunately, in a very negative way. They push this because they need to push the dominant ways of thinking about uh, the disease because it serves their personal and organizational missions. So follow the money and try to figure out who really has the best interests of patients in mind. And sometimes it's not the people that are claiming they're putting the patient's interests first. I hate to make that as a negative message, but part of wisdom is looking for power, looking for money and saying, we've got to change the way power and money are distributed in society. And I, I, I really don't know any better way to summarize it. And I think that involves, uh, in, in the psychological sense, not um, just growing older and richer, but growing older and wiser. And that takes um, usually very uncomfortable conversations, uncomfortable situations. Um, and that's how we do grow. And I'm very happy to have um, met you both and and uh, have a copy of this of your book and interview you because I think you both are trying to live that truth um, and speak the truth and not just go along with um, something that sounds like a you know a miracle drug. I mean, I'm, I remember hearing the news about Adjuhelm and all of a sudden whatever company 
I don't remember what company made it, but their stock price, of course, went up, you know, to some unimaginable level and everyone's cashing in on the short term buy sell of that. And so I'm really, I'm really glad that you both are sticking to your, your, uh, your values uh, here. And I think that's a good example for any listeners who are out there in, in whatever field they're in. Um, so I want to make sure that the listeners can not only, of course, find your book, which um, America Demen- American Dementia, Brain Health in an Unhealthy Society. And of course, an easy way to get that is just to type that into Google or americandementia.com. Of course, I always advocate buying directly or bookshop.org um, where you can buy a book online and the proceeds of any extra proceeds go to um, local brick and mortar bookshops um, where culture is made. Uh, Danny, if you want to tell us a little bit more how people could reach you, and I'm going to, of course, put a lot of things in the show notes, a lot of links for you in the show notes. Yeah, we appreciate that, Paul. Um, we also keep a Facebook page uh, based on the title of our first book. It's just The Myth of Alzheimer's. If you search on, on Facebook, people can find us there and communicate with us there. Um, I'm on Twitter at DRG Daniel George. And uh, Peter's on Twitter too. I managed to get get a boomer onto Twitter. So, oh. <laughs> Peter, I can't remember your handle at the moment. Do you want to share that? Uh Golly day. I'm not sure I can remember it. So it tells you you haven't succeeded yet, Danny. <laughs> well, if you've got if your name's on there, well, we can find it by searching, probably. The slu- the sleuths will find you. That's right. And then um th- lastly, Peter and I are going to start blogging for psychology today, uh, this right. fall. So we'll we'll be there. And uh yeah, just to put a bow on what Peter said and what you said, Paul, you know, we're um uh even if we face a reality right now where things aren't amenable to change so much what we can do is tell the truth and try to describe the world as as it exists and so that's what we're going to try to do um uh, with this book rolling out excellent well um thank you so much for all of your time and your work into this book and this and and your leadership in the field and and i'm i'm sure many listeners will be inspired and um follow you, read the book, share this recording with people they know. So thank you so much for coming on. Great. Thank you for having us, Paul. We really enjoyed it. Thank you, Paul. And there you have it. You have listened to another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast with your host, Paul Krause. I just have to comment and say that I really hope you enjoyed this episode and that you get in touch and at least follow Dr. George and Dr. Whitehouse on Twitter or uh, read a little bit about them. I really think they're doing excellent work, uh, not only in their respective fields, but uh in caring about our society at large and pointing out some of the difficult truths uh, that need to be spoken. So I was quite inspired by that discussion. If you are looking for an EMDRIA consultant, I am now an EMDRIA consultant and I'm essentially almost certified. Uh, Currently I'm still in training, but I can provide 15 of the 20 hours needed to become EMDRIA certified. I uh, have groups going on right now on Wednesdays um, on Zoom, and if you want to be a part of that, you can check uh, that out at counselingsupervisorgr.com or just going to healthforlifegr.com and sending me a message. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with a local counselor in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids area at Health for Life Grand Rapids and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting www.healthforlifegr.com. And thanks to new telehealth rules, if you are in the state of Michigan, you can work with any of our clinicians online. So if you're having difficulty finding somebody near you, Give us a call and see if we can help you. Our number is 616-200-4433. 
The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guests. And while these are based upon literature, research, studies, and experience in their respective fields, they should not be viewed as a definitive opinion on any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you are in a crisis, please dial 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. Are you a young person of color feeling down, stressed out, or overwhelmed? Text STEVE, that's S-T-E-V-E, to 741741, and a live, trained crisis counselor will respond via text. Did you know you could support your local bookstore by shopping online at www.bookshop.org? You can order books from the comfort of your own home while supporting a local business near you. And if you are involved in psychology or counseling, I really recommend getting involved with your state association. Here in Michigan, we have the Michigan Mental Health Counselors Association which is working to increase the availability of quality mental health services statewide, increasing education and promoting best practices, and of course, working to keep licensed professional counselors and other professionals accessible by the public. You can join by checking out their website. Of course, I'm also a member of the Arizona Counselors Association, which I also see as doing excellent work. Until next time on The Intentional Clinician, I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week.